Okay, is that sharing the managing bias in AI? I hope. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, um, hi, I'm, I'm Claire Britton. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm a technical consultant at um, Wolfram Research. So what we do is, um, well, my role in the company is sort of people come to us with um, technical projects that they want help on or they want us to write it and uh, we'll either help them with their code or we'll write it for them um, in Mathematica. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the risks of um, AI and particularly bias in AI and sort of how we can go about trying to mitigate those risks and sort of validating the data and things like um, things like that. So um, these are things we're going to go over. So we're going to go over sort of what is AI just very briefly, um, you know, how it's used. Um, and the big thing is how bias is introduced, how we can manage this bias, and then um, how do we can mitigate it as well by assessing the result, results, um, validity, and of course, being able to explain how the AI is doing it, which is um, surprisingly challenging. And then finally, sort of the human's role in AI, because um, I think AI is often touted as sort of this amazing thing that can do everything. So what's the point of humans. Um, so we'll go over a little bit sort of our role um, in the process. So what do we mean by AI, artificial intelligence? But at its most simple, it's creating a model with predictive power. So um, you get a bunch of data and you try and predict sort of a trend. So here we could do this manually. So I could move this and be like, all these points seem to seem to show an upwards trend here. And when you make these predictive models, you have to make the assumption that this is averagely going to stay on the same uh, trend and obviously it doesn't just have to be a straight line um, AI can be a lot more complicated than that but the idea is is that um, you can make a trend and you can say anything that was here would probably be around here even though you don't have those data points um, you know here if you don't have these data points and up here if you don't have those um, as you can see here so here I've just done it manually but AI would sort of look at that data for you and try and automatically create that trend for you um, so here it's done automatically. And by the way, uh, during this presentation, I'm using Mathematica code if you're um, unfamiliar with that. So that's what I'm using. And this is a notebook. So that's why I can run it um, in here. Okay, so there are many uses of machine learning, of course. Um, as we all know, here is just some basic things. So we have text classification. Let me know if this is big enough for everyone as well. I've just put in, this is going to be tiny here, but I've put in, I like maths. And um, this is just a very simple, um, classifier, sort of machine learning algorithm, and it says, okay, I think this is in the English language. I think the topic is probably something to do with school or university, which probably makes sense to do with maths. Um, it doesn't know that, oh, it says the sentiment is negative, which is probably the wrong thing, but there we go. AI isn't always perfect. Um, and then that the sentiment doesn't think it's spam, doesn't think it's profanity, and doesn't know the gender, but I could change these things and maybe that would sort of get better results. Um, we can have image recognition. So usually I do this with my own image. I just thought, that's an amazing um, image. Um, and then we can have the sort of AI decide, okay, it looks like this is a female. Um, she looks about 14. I think she was actually 12, so that's not far off. Um, it's sort of trying to guess the facial expression here. It says neutral, which is not a bad um, sort of idea. I think she was actually angry, um, but it's not bad. It kind of looks like that. She's not really showing much um, expression that an AI would be able to pick up maybe. Um, of course, prediction. So here, this AI is trained on colorized images and it's trying to take this image and trying to sort of color it in without any extra data. And you can see it's done a pretty pretty decent job there. So it's um, made the grass all green and shown a little sort of um, black puppy here, which is very sweet. Um, and that's this is the whole thing. So it's just been trained on other images from black and white and um, the colorized image. And it's tried to work out what, what things work best. I don't know exactly how this works behind the scenes. That's a the thing with AI, it all goes on um, behind the scenes and we don't know exactly how it does what it does unless we explicitly tell the AI to tell us that. Um, and of course, sequence predictions. So we give it um, data and we try and guess what's gonna happen uh, next. We also have feature extra extraction. So this is, in this example, it's an example of unlabeled data. I gave it a bunch of images of three different types, types of dogs. I didn't label it at all. So I didn't say these are chihuahuas, these are um, Irish wolfhounds or anything like that. I've given it to the AI and the AI has, AI has looked at all the images and it's tried to pick out various features. I don't know what those features are. Um, obviously, if I was doing it, I'd think, well, maybe it's small, maybe it is pokey ears or something like that. Um, and then I've tried to get some feedback from the AI and say, how did you make that decision? And where have you clustered them? So this is how it's clustered them. So I think it's done a fairly good job here. So it's got all these little 
sort of chihuahua type dogs, these little ones up here, it's got the Irish wolf hands here. I'm not a dog expert, so I may be getting the species wrong, but um, that's what these sort of big looking dogs here and then these sort of small ones with the floppy ears down here. So it's done a pretty de decent job and that's with no labeling at all. So you've just given it the data and it's figured it out itself, um, the different clusters within that data. Of course, it could have clustered it differently um, and you know maybe all the photos that were being held by humans would have been in one cluster. Um, so it can cluster in many different ways and that can have many different uses. Um, and as well, we can use AI in artistic approaches as well. I mean, a, a lot of apps have this um, and it, actually in particular in terms of bias, there've been a few issues with this. I think there was one where it was trying to get, um, you put in your photo and they were trying to make it look like a Renaissance art or something, but because all of the art ended up being mainly white Eastern European people, or European people, um, and then and then all the data it was trained on was also a lot of white people. Um, there was issues that if you were darker skin toned, you weren't, the painting was not darker skin toned, it was sort of transforming them into a, a sort of European looking person. Um, so that really, really ties into bias here. And here's just an example where you've put in two paintings, or this could be anything, an image, um, and it's tried to recreate a, an image that sort of combines the style of both. So you can see there's all sorts of different uh, projects you can do with AI. Um, those are just some really basic ones. Of course, we have really far more complex things, um, a lot to do with medical AI, and, and we'll go over a few examples um, as we go through this talk. So what, um, how do these AIs get created? The main sort of fuel for AI is, of course, the data. Um, and you can have mainly three different types of data. Um, so you have the supervised learning, which is labeled data. So with the example with the dogs, I would have said, these are chihuahuas, and then it would sort of work it out from that. Um, but I actually gave it unsupervised learning, which was unlabeled data. Um, and um, we'll, we'll go over sort of all of these um, as we go through mainly labeled data and unsupervised and, sorry, and reinforcement learning. Um, there are a lot of advancements in both and all of these really. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. I think the, uh, in terms of like learning how games work, the unsupervised learning has definitely seen a lot of good things to it. And the AlphaGo, if you, you've watched that documentary or kept up with that, um, that was all unlabeled data and unsupervised learning. So you just sort of gave it the rules and it worked it out for you. Um, and the idea of reinforcement learning is when the AI is in the loop. So it sort of, it does its predictions and those go back into its learning training data. So it sort of, um, it learns as it goes on. Or as we'll see with bias, it, it sort of reinforces biases as it go, goes on. Okay, so now to the main topic, which is um, bias. So, and how we can manage it. So the, the issue with, um, AI is that a lot of people see it as, you know, it's a computer, so it's not going to be biased and it's making some good decisions. And it's true that computers are, of course, not biased, uh, but data is. Um, and there could be good bias. So, you know, um, bias towards higher accuracy in classes that are overrepresented in your data. Maybe you want this. Um, maybe it's more representative of your target data. You can also introduce bias to algorithms to actually combat um, other biases or. Um, to give the AI an idea of um, how risky something is if it makes one decision over another. So there can be a lot of good bias in data, um, or you can have bias that is just going to be there. You can have bias that is representative. So it doesn't necessarily uh, mean it's bad and you're not going to get rid of it anyway. So most of the time, so bias will probably be there. But the main thing we're going to be talking about is the bad bias in data. So um, bad bias can come from many different places and can have really bad consequences. Um, we've seen sort of um, AIs that can't identify faces for if you've got very light skin or very dark skin, it just won't identify your face as a face. Um, and that AI was used all over the place, including um, UK passport control, but also in, you know, I don't know if it was the same AI, but it had the same problem um, with, I think it was a PS4 with a camera on it. So just, and all these different applications that had a video, um, software where they had to identify the face that was wasn't used so th this this idea of bad bias has real genuine effects on the world and we see it all over the place in particular in healthcare um, so it's something we've got to be really aware of so the sources of that bad bias we're going to um, go over um, essentially it's 
It's also having unjustified confidence in the data and the quality of the prediction. So once you have that data and you and it's biased, and if you really believe in it, that's when it becomes dangerous because that's when you start making real world decisions which can be wrong. Um, and also, of course, insufficient data, bad data, and insufficient validation is a big one as well because sometimes you don't realize the bias until you go through a validation testing stage and that's when they become apparent. Um, because AI will always find trends in data and they may not be what you want. So you may have heard of this example. Um, so this was a husky and it was misidentified as a wolf. And when we look at the photo, we might think, oh, maybe it's because the color of the fur is kind of gray. Um, maybe it is, maybe it looks kind of wolf-like, maybe it's the teeth. Um, but when they wrote as part of the algorithm some feedback of how did you make this decision? You know, how, why did you say that this husky was a wolf? Um, this is what the AI came back with. So it didn't even look at the dog at all. And the only thing it was focusing on was this sort of bit in the background, which was the snow. So this showed the bias in the data because bias doesn't always have to mean um, sort of the bias that we talk about a lot in, in sort of in the day-to-day -day world, sort of the, the bias of different genders, of different races, of different religions. It's not always that kind of bias. Um, it can be the bias in the literal data in terms of how representative it is um, and what it's shown. So in this case, all the photos of the huskies were provided by pet owners of huskies indoors and all the photos of wolves that were sort of fed to the AI to, to train it were of um, wolves outside in the snow. So that's why it didn't even look at the dog at all and it decided just based on this snow on the outside that that was um, a wolf and not a husky. Okay, so one of the first um, issues uh, in terms of how bias is introduced is, of course, false information. If you have uh, bad information in, you're going to have bad results out. That's just how it's going to be. So really, from the very beginning, from when you're choosing your source to the location you get your data, that's when the first bias can get introduced. I mean, um, so of course, you can have unreliable sources. So, um, for example, if you're trying to get a sort of poll on how the UK thought of uh, uh, politics or something like that, and you went to a news station which was very left wing or very right wing, of course, you're going to get a very biased view and it's not going to show the overall opinion of the UK. So if you're going to do that, you've got to be very careful on what you're saying that your AI is representing and what the data you got actually represents. Um, well, you have things like survivor bias, which um, uh, I'm sure many of you know this, but for those of you who don't came from the, um, the planes that were being shot at, and at first they were looking at the, the sort of planes that had bullet holes in them thinking, okay, well, we've got to make sure those areas are protected. But the problem was it's that those planes that had the bullet holes were the planes that were coming back and the planes that didn't come back were where they'd been shot in different places. So someone realized that they should actually be protecting the bits um, where the planes didn't have bullet holes in them because that was the areas where the, the planes were actually not even coming back at all, um, but they didn't have that data. Um, and of course, you have the non-response bias, which is um, a lot to do with surveys where people sort of miss out certain questions or don't respond, or you collect it from a bad location um, and, uh, and you, you get the bias there because who, who sort of responded, who didn't respond. Um, and that's the same with poor, this sort of goes into poor collection techniques is that a lot of these online polls, for example, who clicks on them, who decides to actually answer them? Um, you know, if you get sent an email afterwards that says, could you sort of respond to this um, poll or survey? The, there's a lot of biases in the people who decide to actually click on that. Usually they've had maybe a very good or very bad experience and they're the only people that you're getting to do it. Um, there are lots of different reasons why. Uh, in terms of online polls with politics and stuff like that, you often see that the polls were posted on, for example, the Twitter feed of a very particular person where their followers tend to be, or the people who see that tend to be Sort of bias to one opinion or another so the collection techniques have to be sort of from the right location and also you've got to think about what options do you give so if you went to a movie review and, and they start they sort of gave you a survey to respond to afterwards uh, but you only gave them three options you know did you like the movie did you love the movie or did you think the movie was the best thing in the world um obviously you're not going to get a full view because you didn't have an option for people who didn't like it um so everyone's going to say that they liked it of course and that's just poor collection techniques and that can be done purposely or not. And, and obviously with um, advertising, things like that, you can, you can get that. Um, but you've got to be aware of that when you're collecting data for AI as well, because the bias sort of goes everywhere. And of course, you can have faulty processing. 
So this is more to do with once you've got the data, then you don't process it in the right way. Um, this can come from not fully understanding the data. Um, so for example, if you're measuring COVID responses in you know, America and Japan, and you were just measuring the total number of deaths, obviously that doesn't make sense because America is a much larger population than Japan. So you've got to be really aware of, of um, sort of knowing all these steps and making sure you've got reliable so sources from the right locations um, and, um, and sort of the right collection techniques as well as the right processing afterwards. Um, okay, so then you can also have poison data. Um, so this is more to do when data has been deliberately poisoned. So that means it's, it's sort of um, been altered in a way that that's um, that sort of can be malicious or just for, for fun, I guess, with this one. Um, so this is a very um, famous example um, with the Microsoft uh, chat boxes. So there was Tay and Shao Ois, Shois, I think I can't remember how to pronounce it. Um, and they were both created by Microsoft, both had the sort of same idea of a chat box. Um, and the Tay AI was, you know, originally designed pretty well and it had a, had a nice thing, but once it got released to the public, um, on Twitter, and it was trying to learn from the conversations it had with people who responded to it to try and learn how to create conversations and to have conversations as a human would have them. Would have them. But very quickly, people caught on to this and, um, and they started to sort of have horrible uh, sort of messages with it, and it turned up being really racist, sexist, Nazi, all for genocide, all of these things, and started sort of saying all these you know horrific things on twitter so they had to shut it down within 24 hours it could have been even less than that um whereas choice on the other hand um had a very different response and it was sort of uh, publicized in a different way through a different avenue and now it's sort of all over the place it has you know over over six million now um users um in over different places in the world um i think primarily in sort of a asia but really um, everywhere and it, and that's and it's a great AI and it works really well and it has it's I think it passed the Turing test for about 10 minutes so it's great and it worked really well and it's by the same companies but one of them didn't have poison data and the other one did and obviously the uh, the longevity of each of those were drastically different because of that of course you can drive your own data with um, incentives so this was an example of um, John McLean which is my manager so he did this but I've done similar things as well um, I just stole his example here, <laughs> where he had an online shopping thing, and um, and the idea was that he got two accounts, and one of them he only shopped with promotions, and the other one he just did the normal shopping with, um, and he noticed with the one that he shopped with promotions on, he got all these much more promotion deals than the other one did, because they realized, oh, this person only shops when there's promotions, and the other one doesn't, um, so they sort of made that bias like that, so you can introduce your own bias, um, I've definitely tried to do it uh, with my own things, try to sort of um, use the bias to my advantage in the AI who's trying to learn um, to sort of show me less adverts or things like that. Not with much success yet, but I'm still trying. <laughs> um, okay, so another source of bias is of course sampling bias. Um, so this is where your data can be non-representative, um, sometimes as a result of chance or sort of accident. Um, and one of the ways that this is often sort of, well, a lot of the, the, the issues actually that um, that try to be mitigated is by increasing the sample size. And in a lot of places, this is of course a good thing. So if you increase the sample size, um, that can get rid of a lot of the biases in your data. However, not all the time, because if your sampling technique is bad, then it doesn't matter how big your um, data set is if it's still gonna be skewed with that same bias. Um, so for example, if, if you were trying to get the, um, what people thought of music tastes around the around England, for example, where, where I am, and you only got those data points outside of a Taylor Swift concert, obviously everyone's going to say, yeah, no, I, I think Taylor Swift is the best. And no matter how many people you survey at that place, if that's the location where you're collecting that data, your data is going to be biased and unrepresentative. Of course, if your target data was do how many people actually really like Taylor Swift who go to Taylor Swift concerts, then that's correct. And then you want to be representative of that data and if you sampled from all over the UK, that would be a bad decision because that's not um, representative of your target target data. And that's an interesting, that's an important point to um, to remember is that your your 
data doesn't have to be super unbiased to everything in the universe. It just has to be representative of the target data, the, so the, the sort of population, for example, if we're talking about people that, um, that you want to represent. So here's, um, here's another example. If your target data is rep unrepresentative and it is biased, um, but you can't change that. So you can't you know, change the location, your, your sort of sampling technique can't be changed and it just is that way. So let's, for example, say, um, so this is obviously a data set which is highly biased towards being more male. So there's way more, uh, way more men in this data set than, than women. And you could say that maybe this was at a male sort of dominated place. For example, I think football matches tend to be much more male dominated in terms of the audience um, compared to women there. Um, obviously there's a mix, but in terms of the bias, there's, um, there's a far greater men there. Um, so in this data set, if we're looking at the height and we saw we've got this one woman here, which is uh, one meter 67 and, and all the men are sort of above that height. Um, th this function here um, takes this data and creates a machine learning algorithm. So this is what classify does. This is the Wolfram language. So this is now created a classify function. So this essentially is sort of a mini AI here, which is uh, taking this data. Obviously this is a tiny sample, very simple um, uh, algorithm here, but it's taken that data and it's tried to figure out uh, how to how to sort of categorize um, between these men and women depending on this um, the height here. So if I try and predict um, the gender based on this height, as you can see, 1.67 is the only data point that's a woman in this data set. And yet the classifier function said, no, I think it's a man. And that's because there are so many more men in the data set and the, the height isn't that different from the, the next one that the likelihood is that it probably is a man if this was a new data point, because it probably is a man who was there. However, if you didn't want that and you can't change the data set, but you didn't want the your AI to sort of take um, into account that there are more men there than not, and you don't want it to be biased to, towards that, you want it to just look at the data that it's been given and you, you want to basically make it assume that it was actually 50-50. So that bias there of, just how many were in there, and that the, the sort of unrepresentative nature of your um, of your data set, you can um, sort of counteract that bias in your AI itself, in the algorithm itself. So this is where you go from collection techniques to actually changing the algorithm to to sort of adjust for that. Because um, here, if we look at the problem, oh, let me just set this again. Maybe I didn't run it again. Okay, not sure whether that's not displaying properly. Okay, um, sorry. Um, okay, so usually let's just ignore this because I think I've done, maybe I, I didn't clear my functions or something. But the idea was, is that basically the probability of this AI choosing that it was woman, that it was a woman um, from 1.6 of height onwards was basically always at 45%. It never got above 50 because of the bias of there being so many more men in this data set. So what you can do is actually in your algorithm itself, you can say, assume that the data set is 50-50 and say, actually just say that there are 50% men and 50% women. And then it won't take that into account when you actually go and go and try and predict it. And then it can say, okay, now that I think that's a woman. Um, so you can actually change your algorithm itself to make sure that it that beforehand it decides 50% men, 50% women. And that bias is basically not taken into account when your algorithm is trying to decide um, which one, um, which one to choose. Okay, so um, of course, another important sort of um, source of bias is humans and humans in really any step of the whole process. Um, so which is pretty much um, every step, because of, from the beginning of your of your study, the data collection, the data entry, data cleaning, um, the, the model choice, what algorithm you choose, um, how you implement it, how you assess the results, all of that, um, all has human involvement and that is all a sort of surface area for um, bias to come in and, and humans to make assumptions um, based on various things. And it can even come from the, the data source itself. So, I mean, we all have a subjective, subjective sort of idea of what the truth is. Um, and I've just put this picture here because, I mean, it was a very small study, but um, down to people rating whether someone was a warm person or a cold person was 
correlated to whether that person was holding a warm warm drink of something or an ice drink um, and that actually affected how what they thought of the person so obviously humans are very um sort of um at risk of being extremely subjective um and also not saying the truth i mean in a lot of data sets um sort of uh, psychologists have done experiments on this and seen that even in anonymous surveys people will still lie um so whenever humans have decided that this is what the truth is always take that with sort of a large tablespoon of salt um, and don't take it for the truth. Um, and that's because there are so many sort of varying factors and also it has a trickle down effect with the bias. So at every step of the process, you need to be um, looking at it and who's participating and, and where, where did you get that locate that data from? Like what location did you get that data from? Is it representative of the target data? Um, and, and sort of everything like that to make sure that you're not introducing bias that shouldn't um, shouldn't be there and making assumptions that are that are wrong. Um, of course, sometimes human bias is okay because that's what you're looking for. So for example, on Facebook algorithm or things like that, um, when it thinks, what video am I gonna click on? That is using your biases, but it doesn't matter because it's saying, well, what, like, what video is she most likely to click on? And what sort of subjects is she most likely to maybe comment on? Um, and it would be successful at predicting that. Um, the issue is, is if, if it then jumps from, oh, I'm interested in clicking on that, or I'm interested in commenting on that, into she's actually genuinely interested in the topic, or she's um, she likes that topic, and that's sort of a jump, and that's an assumption that's most likely not too not not true. Um, I think we see that a lot recently, particularly on on um, sites like Facebook, where you see these sort of very sensationalized articles and headlines, or or even things that are just deliberately trying to get people riled up you, you sort of see whole articles with these big sensational titles of you know people were in uproar about something and then you look into the data and sort of three people out of a hundred thousand had an issue with something and they make this big news story because they know people are going to comment on it and they think well that means that they're interested but it doesn't mean they're interested it just means that they're so you know can't believe that there's an article about it that they've got to write um they've actually just got to write something on so um so we've really got to be very aware of of humans in the whole process. So here's um, a, a real world example. Um, so I thought we should have some of this. So there were, this is in um, America and basically there was this AI that was written to decide whether, um, how likely it was that someone who just been released from prison would reoffend. that's what they said. So their model was, is that they get released, uh, will they reoffend or will they not reoffend based on whether they go back um, to prison or not. Um, and obviously this is a very simplified um, model because if we have a sort of richer model of it, well, that's not loading. We can see that the reality is actually far more complex. So we have the releasing, um, of course they could reoffend, And then it's not just reoffend; they get sent to prison, which is sort of what they, um, they jumped to. They said reoffend convicted. But in reality, they get reoffended, and then they could get caught, or they could not get caught, in which case they wouldn't be convicted. Um, they could get caught, and they could um, not get prosecuted. Again, they're not convicted. They could get caught, get prosecuted, and then sort of let go, not convicted. They could get caught, prosecuted, and convicted, in which case then they would go back to prison. Um, they also obviously could not reoffend um, and not get convicted. Or alternatively, some people um, don't reoffend, still get prosecuted for something they didn't do. And are convicted. And obviously, in all these steps, a lot of bias can be introduced. So, um, already we we know that the sort of criminal justice system is not always um, unprejudiced and unbiased. In fact, there's issues in that that are that are shown over and over and over again. Um, there have been a lot of studies in terms of prosecution and juror decisions, um, you know, and being swayed by things like um, uh, gender, race, accent. Um, the words that have been used to describe them, what they were wearing, um, and also in terms of jury decisions that have so much bias in it. My, my sister's a psychologist, she tells me um, all these studies, uh, she tells me about these studies all the time. Um, so for, for example, there'll be jurors and the, the, the how a group decisions are made, huge amount of bias in that, whether you're a competent person, whether how you speak can have a huge effect on what the sort of um, unanimous decision is. Um, you also have, um, 
things about what the jurors say is something that's a um, sort of a credible source of information. So a lot of people will say, oh, um, witness testimony, that's fairly credible and you know we believe in that. But with, with witness testimony is one of the most unreliable sources of information and has been shown again and again and again um, to be unreliable. So there is so much bias that goes on with this. Um, so to say with their really simple model, oh, they get released and re either they reoffend and don't reoffend, and that's what we're predicting, is completely wrong. Um, but what's important with this is that it doesn't mean that this AI is useless um, or anything like that, because it is arguably predicting um, accurately that the people who get released, um, that these people are more likely to end up back in prison for whatever reason. Um, you know that's just the reality of the world apparently that these people happen to go back to prison more and whether they're biases or not if that's accurately predicting that then it has a use um, for that case but obviously if it's being used for something for control on the other hand so if you say oh no these people will reoffend, so therefore we're not going to release them or we're gonna uh we're gonna sort of impose higher sanctions on them or, or we're gonna we're gonna sort of follow them or anything like that you know, we're not going to allow them trust, we're going to put them in a house where they're being watched or something like that, um, then that's when it becomes a really dangerous issue because you're now using predictive algorithms that are good at predicting something that is not what you're assuming it is. And and th this has a lot to do with what, you know, sort of how you, once you get the result, how are you interpreting that? And that's an important source of bias as well because, um, you know, you could have done all that work to make your algorithm um, non-biased non and to get really representative data and all of that. And then you get to the point where you get an answer and you're misinterpreting that answer to mean something it doesn't. And it's very easy to make assumptions. And when you're really close to something, you don't think about it. And, um, and also if you've created a hypothesis and your theory proves it, um, sometimes you're less likely to question that. Um, whereas if it doesn't prove, doesn't prove it, then maybe you're more likely to do sort of more rigorous um, testing to make sure that, that it does sort of do what it's meant to do. Um, so really be aware of that, basically. Um, so if we have a look at this prediction versus control, um, we're going to look at a very similar example. Again, some of you may be aware of this was a pred poll. Um, I think sort of play on words on prediction policing. Um, this is a, a picture of Berlin, but it was actually um, in America. I think most of my examples are from America. I just um, know a lot more of those. I, I don't know if there's I think there's, it's less widespread in the UK, sort of these um, very biased algorithms having sort of big effects um, and being used extensively, but I'm sure there are many examples that I just, um, I guess I don't, they don't, I don't hear about them as much. I know that the UK border control was using that, um, uh, that passport uh, facial algorithm that wasn't working um, for very light skinned or very dark skinned people, which obviously was incredibly biased um, and caused a lot of issues and should not happen. Um, and in fact, that that AI was updated to sort of correct that bias, um, but not all the places that used it updated their software. So, <laughs> a bit silly. Um, okay, so with Predpol, Predpol, um, it was an AI that was actually self-reinforcing, so it was doubly bad. So not only was it so okay, I'll just, so the idea of it was that they had this AI to to try and work out where because they didn't have enough police to go everywhere so they were limited on police resources of where they could send the police so they thought oh we'll write an ai to find the places where we should have more police so where are more crimes going on um that we need a higher police force to be there so they took past data and they said well these places have more crime so we're going to send police there and then and then then the data that came back from that so if more arrests were made um, in those locations and less uh, arrests were made in different locations that would be fed back into the AI. And, um, and, and that would basically reinforce that, that decision. So it would go like, yep, so now more people are being arrested in that place where we sent more police, obviously. Um, so that place needs more police force because we're, we're the, it has more crime there. Um, and then the places where there was less police being sent there, they, the AI was saying, well, you don't need as much police there. So obviously it was kind of reinforcing um, this bias itself already and then not only was it uh, reinforcing biases it was also um, the data it had sort of been trained on was already biased because 
as we know, there, there's already bias in the police force. Um, there's bias everywhere, of course. Um, I know in America, there's definitely been a lot of sort of talk about the biases in the police force. And, you know, this AI was only reinforcing that. It was using bias data from the beginning. Well, we assume bias data from the beginning. Um, humans are biased in general, naturally. So it would be very hard to avoid that. Um, but then to have an AI that then reinforces not only what was there, but the mistakes that was made in the past, but then in a sort of nonsensical way that it was saying the places where we send more police, obviously it's going to have more arrests because there's more police there. Um, and so it was just this very bad thing. And, and you know, these things aren't used in isolation. The, the, these things were genuinely used um, in many different areas. And, and you have these um, examples, um, again, mainly from America, where, where they've been tried to use these AIs for um, this predictive policing, but also um, um, sort of deciding who gets bail and who doesn't get bail and stuff like that. Um, I know in the UK, we, we're trying to do this most serious uh, violence um, and we're trying to use AI for that. I think 10 million was invested in it, um, but it didn't get past the ethics committee. And so they they, they can use it. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're still working on it. I know they, they sort of didn't for a while, at least at that point. Um, that wasn't specifically to do with bias. It was just because it was highly inaccurate <laughs> because it was very hard to predict um, whether someone would, would um, it, it was to decide whether someone's first violent offense would be with a gun or a knife, um, but it was just highly inaccurate. And, um, and so, wasn't very useful. Um, so this sort of brings us uh, onto sort of these issues is correlation versus cause. And we hear this all the time. I mean, I've heard this when I was doing, you know, my biology A level, and we hear all the time correlation versus cause. And yet it's surprising that it's an issue that comes up again and again. Um, so it's worth repeating because, and you know, now we, we say it and it's the forefront of our mind, we'll see it in other places where again, sort of correlation versus cause was overlooked. Um, and, and got wrong. So of course, um, if we've got um, A and B, we can say that A predicts uh, B for whatever reason. So we could say maybe, um, this is probably gonna be too small to see, but this says causes. So we could say um, maybe A predicts B because A causes B or B causes A, um, or there could be C which causes A um, and B. But if we're not looking at that and we say that, and sort of we decide A is B. So for example, if we're going on a run, um, outside and we get sunburn, we could say runners get sunburn. And then, um, and, and, and you could say running causes sunburn if you didn't know what the actual cause was. But the fact is, is that the people who go running, they happen to go running outside and they're getting actually sunburn. So what causes it is the sun and the people who run or being outside in the sun, um, which is C and, um, and A was the running. And of course, the, how to get through that um, is to, is to, um, validate your results. So you test it. So you can say, okay, if running causes uh, sunburn, um, let's, well, they wouldn't know at the time, but the, you know, burning red skin, you have to try people running in lots of different environments, those kind of things. And does every runner get sunburn? If so, why not? And then maybe you'll see the people indoors on a treadmill don't, and then you can start to analyze that data. Um, so a really important aspect or step in mitigating bias is, um, is testing your data. So here, um, this is just another example of, you know, the bearded men crash cars. Does does the beard m make you crash cars? Um, or is it the fact that the people who have beards tend to be men and men seem to crash cars more often or something like that? Um, and this is just what I was saying of using prediction for prediction things and uh, where you, well, using prediction for control is an issue. So if you've got predictive algorithm, uh, don't use it for control. So if you said from that, um, from this thing here that, okay, no bit, no, no people with beards are allowed to drive cars. Um, that would obviously be a ridiculous thing because you're using something that maybe was beneficial predictively. Maybe um, men do cause more car crashes. I think that they, they were actually going to go into an example where we see that men do have a higher likelihood of causing um, crashes that cost more in, um, in the UK. But um. Um, but if you if you use this for controlling, you said okay, bearded men can't can't do it. Then that's um that that's when AI becomes dangerous because you're using it uh, for something that shouldn't be used for, um, particularly judging from sort of the unthorough checking of your AI. And this is why um, we have all these sort of ethics committees and things like that, where to check your AI very rig rigorously from start to finish, and particularly after it's done, to make sure it's predicting the right things and you're using it in a sensible um, way. 
So this is the idea of the protective and sensitive classes. So um, those sort of include um, in a, in a lot of um, countries that you, know, you can't make decisions based on the sex of someone because of discrimination laws, um, the race of someone or um, someone's religion usually. Um, and you see a lot of AIs that create this bias um, and they try and basically solve it by removing that protective class. Um, so for example, a very uh, famous example um, was the Amazon's AI to help them sort of screen uh, resumes and decide who to hire. Uh, but obviously Amazon was pretty disappointed that this didn't sort of solve their issues with diversity and equity and inclusion because it was based off 10 years of data of their previous hiring history, which was mainly maybe men. Um, and then they worked out that because they checked this algorithm and they worked out that the algorithm was screening out people that were women. And even though they had removed women from the from this sort of class and they didn't put women like whether they didn't put the gender um as a as a, as a sort of data point it was still being um select it's still being biased towards men because it was sort of it was um it was assessing things like whether they had gone to women's colleges whether the word woman was in the application at all um and they were being screened out because the likelihood was that the the past AI was based on you know mainly men getting the position, and so that was it was reinforcing that bias from before um, very badly. And you know, the these the I don't personally I don't think AI should be used for decisions to do with um, sort of these life decisions such as hiring people because it's one of those um, fields where. Um, the sort of outliers are sometimes important and you know I don't think we should be penalizing the people who maybe are different from the from the sort of normal thing and in, particularly with the men and women we saw we see much more um, you know women in tech or engineering um, condition, uh, condition, uh, positions than we did before um, so if you're basing an AI on, on the past um, that has now changed then um, then you're going to have issues and I just but it's surprising um, how many companies are using these AIs to, to, to help them with hiring. I personally don't think AI is suited for this because it's sort of, it's sort of, it's one of these emotive decisions and, um, and it's to do with so many varying different factors that change a lot. So really, I, I don't think it's sort of apt for it at all. And as we've seen again and again, it can be um, very biased. Because um, obviously it's being fed data from humans. So the best it's going to do is sort of be as biased as the humans that came before it. Um, and also not adapt to the change. And then it's kind of going to be sort of not even moving us forward to be less biased. It's actually just going to sort of keep us backwards. Of course, there are um, things that have been done to try and mitigate this and try and make it less biased. Um, but in general, I don't think it, it's um, a good idea to have AI uh, to make these decisions. But I think um, people definitely disagree with me uh, there. But I think it just means that those people who are different end up getting screened out. And I don't think people who are different should be penalized, you know. Um, and, you know, and, and that goes, this is just getting, you know, just getting hired. But when you look at it being used in the criminal justice system and maybe someone's predicted to commit a violent crime, but they've changed their ways, they've changed their life. Um, and they're now sort of a peace loving person, then they shouldn't be criminalized for that when they are, they, they are different from the sort of trend. Um, uh, another example where they, there was a gender bias, so this is in the, the UK, um, there was a difference between what men got charged for insurance and what women got charged for insurance. Um, and so there's a £27 difference between whether you're a man or, or a woman, um, because they were using algorithms to decide whether men or women were more likely to commit, uh, to, commit uh, to crash um, the car or cause damages to the car and how much that would cost the insurance company. Um, and sort of there was a, there was issues about this because of discrimination based on sex, which is which is um, not legal. But the thing was, even unlike the, the this one, which was based off human biases in the past on on how they um, how they hired people in the past, this bias was reflecting the reality in a way. So um, even after they they removed gender as a data point um, to predict the the insurance. If you look at 2017, according to Confuse.com, the difference was actually larger in 2015 after they got rid of that. 
because that's just how it was. So there were other factors that correlated. So it's not just the data point gender, it's the other things that correlate to that. So maybe scaffolders tend to be um, more likely to be men. It's more of a male dominated industry. And sort of this is the type of car that they drive. And maybe that again, that's more um, tends towards men buying that type of car. And maybe a, a midwife was more of a female dominated industry. Um, and sort of this type of car is, is more likely to be bought by a woman. Uh, by a woman. And so the bias was still there because there were other correlating factors which, which related it. So it was still, if that bias is there, um, it's not like the AI is saying, oh, I, I bias against women, so I'm going to do this, or I'm biased against men, so I'm going to do this. It's because sometimes it's reflecting the reality and that, because, that could be because of other biases in the world, but sometimes that is reflecting how things are happening. And that's what it's trying to look at. It's trying to look at those trends and try and predict. Um, so just removing the variable um, does not always mean that the AI will no longer be biased because it's not making that decision based on just that one data point. Um, and so then this is where we have to come in as humans and try and decide what we want to do with that information. So um, do we um, charge men and women the same? We sort of get a midpoint and we sort of, in a way, overcharge um, women because that's fair and equal or do we sort of leave it as it is, but then that's not fair, even though it's not technically trying to discriminate um, based on gender, it is. So how do we how do we mitigate that? Because sometimes the AI is just reflecting what is happening and we've got to make that ethical decision to sort of go uh, on top of that AI and say, actually, um, this is not fair. So it's so we're going to have to equalize it anyway, because that's that's the decision that um, we want to make. So that's where humans sort of come in um, to those um, decisions. So um, this brings us to the, the importance of um, validating the results to make sure that our predictions are correct. Um, so, um, so the principles of validation. So is that we have our training data and we have our test data. So when you get your um, data, even though even if you don't have a big uh, sample, you've also you always have got to hold some data back um, to train the AI um, to test the AI that you've just trained. Because um, there have been examples where an AI has been trained on a bunch of data, and then that's points from that same data have been used to test the AI, which of course the AI passed with flying colors because it had already seen that data point. Um, so here we've got another machine learning algorithm. Um, of course, this is a you know a ridiculously small sample size. We've got this picture of a dog, and we've labeled it dog, and we've got a picture of a cat and labeled it cat. And we've made this prediction um, sort of AI little function here. Um, and then when we run it with this picture of the same dog, it it recognizes it as a dog because it's seen it before. It doesn't mean it's learned what a dog looks like. It just means that you're giving it the same data that it's already looked at and it knows what it is. Um, and the same with a cat, if it's seen that photo already. So of course, again, it's gonna pass the flying colors. So when you validate your data, it's gotta be unseen data that it doesn't know, it's completely different. Um, and, and then we can see, so here, for example, it said it's a dog. And here, these are very small photos, but this is a cat and this is a dog. Um, it did take a few photos to actually get it wrong, but I mean, it had a 50-50 chance really. <laughs> um, this is the other issue with AI as well, that sometimes it, it has to make a decision. So you've got to put um, thresholds on it because if it shouldn't really be giving me any answer if it doesn't know. So you've got to bear that in mind when you're writing your AIs um, that you that if you if you sometimes you want to put a threshold in to say if you don't know, say it and don't sort of give me an answer um, if, it, if it's unsure and said, say, you know, I'm unsure about this and not um, uh, not give you one. Okay, so um, we've also obviously got to be aware of um, overfitting and underfitting. Um, so if you have your data points, um, what's this the wrong one? Let me just see if this runs. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so um, so what before? So before, so we can uh, manually do it, um, and we can see that this is probably underfitting the data. Maybe we don't, oh, if we just do it automatically. Um, maybe this is underfitting the data. Maybe this is, um, so if we only had, um, you know, this point and, and, and this point, for example, then yeah, we would sort of make our AI 
fit those two like this and we go, okay, that's the trend, but it could be actually completely wrong. If we only had these data points, we, uh, well, in that case, it's not that bad, then we'll try and sort of fit it like this. And it's actually predicting something completely wrong here because we don't have enough data. So there we don't have enough variables. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough features. And um, that's, that's to do with underfitting. Um, and of course, th this creates bias in itself because it's going to be completely sort of skewed one way or the other based on the 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 very unrepresent data, unrepresentative data that you have. Um, whereas you also have the issue of overfitting. So you know how this was decided to be here, and if this was sort of the number of ice creams bought based on the heat of the day, um, if um, and you know these these number was bought because you know. It had, there happened to be a football match on and there was more here and you know, this day there was rain so it didn't happen as much you know there's this various noise in how things happen so it doesn't work on a perfect line and if you overfit your data um, it starts to try and work out something that fits every single point perfectly and it fits all that noise which obviously is nonsensical um, and then you're going to have this really and, th and you would find this out straight away if you have a good validation and you've held back some test data and you'll test it and of course you know if you have a data point you know here and it's and it's predicting way down here obviously you're going to know straight away um that that's completely wrong so you've got to hold back training data um to, to test it um and this comes to sort of measuring uh, success as well so a big part of mitigating these issues in terms of bias in particular is getting feedback from the ai because the AI makes this decision in a way that is often not comprehensible to us because we haven't told it exactly how to make its decision. I mean, that's that's the point of AI. It does it, we, it trains itself in a way. Uh, we tell it sort of how to do it sometimes, sometimes not at all, you know, without AlphaGo. That was completely unlabeled data. It sort of figured it out itself. It did, did many iterations and it worked it out. There's all sorts of um, AI algorithms. And a lot of the time, we don't know exactly how it's made its decision. So that's why it's really important, if possible, when you're writing your algorithms to um, make your algorithm give you feedback on how it's made its decision. So, and how it's made its decision, what mistakes it's made and why. So here we're gonna look at an example where it's gonna take this um, training set, um, which was, in your, this is a pre-trained neural net. We have it as part of the um, database at Mathematica. So this was a, a neural net that was designed to recognize characters, handwritten characters. So you can see it's done fairly well here. So this sort of handwritten uh, zero has been a zero, handwritten nine, nine. I think it's got all of these right here. So this was a neural net designed for that. I mean, that one's pretty hard to judge what, what that one was. Um, and you can see that the accuracy was extremely high, 98%. So it's actually a very good, um, very good AI, but it's made some mistakes. And if we have some feedback on the mistakes, then we can start making intelligent decisions of what, how we can improve our AI, where the biases lie, and how we can fix that. Fix that. So, for example, here we could see that. Okay, so a lot of so these are the ones that have got right in this dark blue, and then in lighter blue, it's the ones that it's misclassified. So, for example, here, um, there's nine 964s were correctly identified, but 16 fours were misidentified as nines, so you, but only one four was misidentified as a one. So we can see if you get feedback like this, where where is it making those mistakes? Is there a bias towards that? I mean, this is to do with numbers, but it's still a bias towards there's making more mistakes here. Why is it making mistakes there? Is it unrepresentative of that data? Do we need more data in that field? Do we need to train it on more fours? to make sure it doesn't misclassify them as nine, do we need to give more nine so it's more sure of what a nine looks like? So putting feedback into your AI that can give you some sort of hints of how it's making its decision is essential to work out where the biases lie in your AI and, and where you need to improve things to stop it. And this is just um, giving us back the, the false positive rate and the false negative rate so you can work out how many sevens were, were well, how many things were said to be a seven when they weren't, or in this case, how many things were said to be um, not a seven when they were. So this kind of feedback and able to analyze the error rates and why your AI is making those errors is really important to mitigate the, the biases. Um, and here's just a, another example with 
Boston Homes. So this was an, an AI to work out to try and estimate the housing prices. So again, I'm just using a mathematical function to create the AI. So now it's just uh, predict making an algorithm here. You can see the um, it's it's chosen the gradient gradient boosted trees method to to write the algorithm, and then I can test it on some data and I can make predictions on that data. And now I'm going to actually I've already run it so we can see here. This is the standard deviation, and now we can see the comparison plot. So this is this little dotted line, I don't know if you can see it, is this of what the perfect predictions would be. And these blue lines are what the actual values were with the test, um, the test data. So you can see it hasn't done too badly. A lot of them sort of fit along the trend, but some of them are really wildly wrong. So these ones up here are completely wrong. What I mean, the 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 algorithm would have, would have said that the house price was way down here, so at 25 here, but the but the actual value was around 50. And this happened with sort of several things up here, and some of them were wildly overestimated when actually they're way down here. And we don't know why that is, but it's worth investigating to say, you know, why why are these? Is there a data point we're not getting? Is there something we're missing that would allow us our, uh, our AI to get these right? So what's the similarity between all these data points? So again, this is to do with sort of pinpointing where your biases are, and and then you can do some research into why exactly. It could be celebrities moved in there, and then that shot the price up, or um a famous movie was made and it sort of represented this area and now the house prices there have shot up. So does your algorithm need to take that into account or do you need to sort of take these, are they so rare that maybe you can take these out and sort of have a special um, sort of different thing when these things are put in that you can put in manually to your AI. Uh, similarly with these ones that are really low down and it was predicted really high up, did a natural disaster hit in that place? Does, does your AI need to take in data points like that that can handle sort of changing world environments is particularly to do with something like house prices that change all the time and can and various so many different factors can have an effect on house price down to the feel of the people or some some viral trend that went around that said something about a particular place and it can change overnight which um which leads me to this other example so this was well the, so the, this is the idea of, of having um, validation in the long run. So you, if your AI worked perfectly when you wrote it, that's great. But don't stop there. So once it's going, you've still got to audit it, you've still got to check it again and again to make sure that it's continuing to be um, to be valid. But the other issue is if you're using AI to predict the future, which often it is useful, then you've got to take into account that the world is changing all the time. Um, and things as volatile as you know the stock market or market prices of houses are really difficult to predict and and haven't had that much success really in, in terms of things like that. So here's an example of a company that tried to write an AI to do a very similar thing in terms of house prices, but they again they use something that may have been relatively okay predictively, but they were they chose to do it with a um a market that was volatile, so that the housing market, which could well it's not always volatile, I guess it's it's pretty um standard, but they did it during COVID. So you might have heard of this, I think is Zillow uh, was the was the um, company and they created it, the, this algorithm, they sort of launched it over over the, the COVID time and they trusted their Zestimates, as they said, so much that they allowed, the, the company bought houses, did some renovations and then sold them on at a higher price. That was the, the sort of business of the um, of this company and they wrote an AI to try and predict what the house price would be in three to six months after they've done their renovations and so buy it at an appropriate price so that way they would gain profit on it once they sold it. However, during COVID, house prices changed a lot um, during that time and th uh, just things changed and neighborhoods got had more value or less value and they allowed their, their AI to make financial decisions and actually send money to places and it ended up making drastically wrong decisions where it was buying things at higher than it could sell them in future. And they lost $304 million um, dollars because of this. And they had to cut about 25% of their staff because of the, the, um, the loss of money and things like that. And they've had to sort of not use it for their idea. And again, as a predict, and now they use it in a much more appropriate way. They use it to give a rough estimate, a starting estimate, and then the salespeople actually come along and they try and work out, okay, actually this, this market has drastically changed because of this, this or this. Um, and then they can make 
appropriate decisions because of that. So really, we've got to be careful when we're when we're making these AIs to do predictions that that we're and and make these final decisions on things that um that that are sort of always changing like this and and are very biased for for various um reasons and to use them in an appropriate way because it's not always the person who's writing the AI. You may be aware as the person writing the AI, the AI that this is biased, but you've got to think about the end user as well. Do they know? Are they going to use it appropriately? And, and everyone has um, the sort of responsibility to make sure that their AI, if they're involved in creating it in any part of the process, should be aware of how it's going to be used, how the end user is going to use it as well to make sure that these issues don't occur. So. Another thing here is, is how we can mitigate the cost of being wrong. So in this example with Zillow, it, it had a huge financial cost to the, to the company. It lost $304 million. So that's obviously a huge cost. But the AI, when it's making its decision, it doesn't know the cost or the loss, you know, with a, not just financial, but the sort of general loss of making a wrong decision. Um, so it, sometimes that can be a real issue like we saw. So here, for example, if we had um, an AI to diagnose someone to, and whether they were healthy or diseased, and if they were healthy, that's great. If they were disease, disease, however, there was a very cheap and you know, and no side effects sort of um, pill that they could take that would cure them, um, and it wouldn't have any adverse side effects if you took it when you were healthy. You would want your AI to say that they were that the sort of err on the side of caution and say that they're diseased even if they were healthy if there was any sort of probability that they might be in fact this is the case in in nepal where, where i used to live um there was this i didn't get it a lot but people came to visit that sort of got stomach bugs and they went to the doctors and oftentimes they were given sort of two pills because one of them it was it, if you had a stomach bug it was going to be this thing or the other thing one of them you get over it in a day the other one could last a few months and be really a uh, real issue and you could just take one pill and it'll be fine um, if it was the other one. So they ended up just giving it to you anyway, just in case. Um, so if you want your AI to be able to do something like that, you've got to tell it explicitly because to the AI, uh, so in this case here, I've, I've made another one of these classify functions, uh, trying to predict based on a, a, a various value, whether someone is healthy or diseased. When I put in this value, 2.45, and I said, what's the probability of this person being healthy and diseased? And said, it's got a four point nine seven or eight chance of the person being diseased but a zero zero point fifty chance of it being healthy of them being healthy so when i run this uh, diagnostic ai it comes back with this person is healthy let them go and obviously this is an issue because it has a huge cost so if that person is going to be severely ill if they are actually diseased and they don't have this pill then that's a big cost and again there are ways that you can adjust for this in your algorithm to and this is what I was talking about at the beginning about actually putting in bias into purposefully injecting bias into your algorithms to to sort of give an understanding to the AI as what of what is good and what is bad. So you can end up sort of punishing the AI for bad for decisions that you don't like and encouraging it in other ways. So here I could put minus one um, for healthy and one for disease. So that way it has a bias towards that. And you can put you know minus a thousand depending on what the the cost of it is and how sure you want it to be. Um, and then in which case now, when I put in the same example, it comes back with diseased. Because not, uh, not, you can't always have something that has a threshold that, you know, if you're not sure, then say inconclusive with things like this, where you've got to put either healthy or disease, you've got to give them something or not, or with the house price where, you know, they had to buy for an amount, they couldn't have an inconclusive sort of um, deal. So in that case with, with the Zillow, I would have, I would have um, uh, advised them to to have something that said to sort of err on the side of caution and put lower values rather than higher values. Um, but then they had to sort of weigh that up against whether that deal would be taken or not. Um, but this is a, a way that in your algorithm you can inject bias in order to counteract or, or in order to sort of give the AI a understanding of the cost of being wrong and the cost of being right. Um, so here I'll just go through um, Another, another really important thing in terms of um, working out how your AI works and finding the biases in, in your AI once it's, um, once it's written. So this is to do with the evaluation stage. You can then go back to your algorithms um, and change it, change it out. 
So this is an AI that's that's uh, based on a wine quality. So this was people who tasted a bunch of wine and they they rated the quality of, of that wine. It's taken a little while to run. I'll just let it uh, train on the data. There's quite a few, there's sort of almost 5,000 examples um, that it's training on at the moment. So you've got this, this AI that has the wine quality, which is not included in the data set. And then all these different variables like the acidity, the density, the alcohol content, all of that. And you want it to decide based on, so it's not going to be given the wine quality, but it will give the, you all these values. And you want the um, your AI to decide how good it thinks that wine is going to be in terms of quality. So in this one, we gave it all of these values and it said it's estimated to be 7.2. It was actually nine. That's not far off because I think the, the estimated wine quality of most of them was pretty low. So it didn't do too badly. It said it's a fairly high rated um, wine there. Uh, this is the important bit though. So Shap values, Shapley values are, they're, they're sort of, um, it's an agnostic model diagnostic. Um, so basically it can be used for any, it, 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 it's not specific on a certain model. It can, it can diagnose, it can have this diag diagnostic run on it. Um, no matter what your AI algorithm is, all it really depends on is the inputs and the outputs. So whatever happens in the middle isn't too too much of, um, of an issue. And what Shapley values do is they give you an idea of how much each of these different um, features here. So here we've got the pH, the sulfates, the alcohol levels, all of this. And it will give you an idea about how important each of those factors were in making the final decision of saying, you know, this was a highly rated wine. How, what, what, which one of those features was more highly used than the other. So when I call this on the, um, this example here, and we get these results here, I can see that, okay, so um, volatile acidity had no effect at all, really didn't matter. That didn't, they, they, the AI didn't care about what that value was, wasn't used. And the same with the total, to, total sulfur dioxide and the re residual sugar. However, alcohol, on the other hand, the alcohol content in this particular example was rated really highly. So this um, feature here, alcohol, was really highly used to make its decision. And this is going to be different for every example and even slightly different each time I run it because um, it's there's some sort of randomness to how it picks um, sort of what, what um, feature it's looking at. And obviously this, in, in terms of wine, you're not really thinking a lot about bias, but if you did this um, on something else and you, for example, change the gender of someone and you run it again and you saw uh, and you switch the gender and you looked at the Chapley values and you could see, oh, it's actually, it's actually using things that are really correlated to gender or really correlated to religion, really correlated to ethnicity, nationality, whatever, all, any of these things that um, of these protected categories that you're looking at, you can see, oh, these features are actually really highly used that, you know, that's bias or that's wrong and we've got to rework something or we've got to make some adjustments to make sure that doesn't happen. So Shapley, value, Shapley values are great in terms of identifying the, the bias um, in, your, in your algorithms. Um, just finishing up here. So I think everyone, every sort of human involved in the process has a real ethical responsibility and they can't, and people can't just say, oh, an AI is doing it, it's not biased, you know. We have a huge um, responsibility in the whole process to make sure it's a good process. So from um, really rigorously and thoroughly looking at the data gathering process, um, you know, making it a point to have um, the, the teams trained in diversity and bias and causation um, and, and looking at the out outcomes. We've got to bear in mind privacy and things like that. So you're not including privacy data and private data um, in your in your algorithm. You've got to make sure it's secure so people can't get any private data or anything like that. Um, and you've also got to look at how to validate the results. You've got to make sure everything is rigorously validated to make sure it's actually doing what it's meant to be doing. Um, and interpreting the results and the ethics and all of that, they've, that's hugely human process. And we've got to audit the AI again and again, not just now, but in future repeatedly. It's not a one-time thing because um, even if an AI is perfect at the beginning, particularly if it works at, on a feedback loop and it gives, it, back, it gives itself back data, it can quickly get poisoned um, or you know, bias can be sort of reintroduced in that way if you don't sort of follow it through its journey and continue, uh, continue to check it. Um, and obviously we're responsible for the ethics of it and how it's used, um, you know, particularly in terms of that prediction and control, what are we actually going to use it for? 
Um, because we see again and again, it's being used in things like the the sort of police system, which I think is wrong, the hiring process, which probably is not great for it, um, all these things. Uh, and we can leave the computers up to what it's good at and these AI uh, machines to make great predictions and to apply decision rules. So the, the computer is really, um, that's what it's good at. It gets, gets its data, it finds the trend, it gives us predictions. That's what it's great for. Um, but let's not go sort of um, into places where it's not so good. And if we do, make sure that we are auditing that process, we're validating all of that, and we're really looking at the ethics of it as well. So I just wanted to um, finish up with just some examples of you know, AI going right, because I've talked a lot about AI going uh, wrong and sort of the disastrous effect had in, on many areas, in, including sort of the medical industry. We've had a lot of, uh, I've looked at a lot of examples, um, again, mainly in America, where there's a huge amount of bias towards you know who gets um, who the AI decides needs healthcare or doesn't need healthcare healthcare in identifying certain issues early on. If it's mainly trained on, for example, white people, which it often was, um, then minority groups were sort of less identified, and that was a huge issue. And so, and all this validation has to go through rigorous processing so that doesn't happen, and that the AI can can sort of work well whether you're in the minority group of the of the sort of Represent, representative population of a country or in your if you're on the majority group of the population you've really got to take that into account but when I goes right there are it's sort of and these systems they're not going to be without bias of course there's bias but it's um but they're still doing great things great cont contributions and if it's better than what a human can do then it's still adding something positive so don't be you know afraid to trust AI at all or to use AI that it's been used successfully in many areas um so this is just an AI that's quite close to me. It's in, in well, in England, <laughs> it's in Cambridge. Um, so this is a, a cybersecurity firm that uses AI called Darktrace, um, and it uses AI to sort of protect our systems. You see it a lot in um, in, in all sorts of places and companies that are using it um, and ones like it. We see successful use of AI in diagnosing and treating patients all the time. We're having huge success in sort of early detection of diseases and being able to help people early on. Um, we have AI in um, in sort of uh, this is a what's it called the bio um, so the, these oh, I can't remember what they're called now bio things I think they're called um, but they have they have AI in it to sort of adjust to how you walk they they did this whole thing where they're going rock climbing with them um, and AI is using that um, we're using it for environmental protection world hunger and all these different um, places so just in conclusion. Um, revise and review every single step of the um, of the process from the very beginning to the very end. Bias is everywhere and you're not gonna get rid of it sometimes, but you can certainly make sure it's making the, doing the right things and the right predictions, I mean, at least representative. Um, provide diversity training to everyone. It's not, you can have a diverse group of people, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna be able to sort of um, properly understand it if, unless they maybe have some kind of training in it. Um, and have a diversely skilled, uh, group of people have a look at the data so not just the sort of data scientists looking at the data and then when it goes to the next step the you know, doctors looking at that um, if different people are involved in different steps you can often get a sort of better wider context so people can understand um, where there's likely to be things going wrong um, really important one to differentiate between predictive results and causal relationships so to make sure that if you're saying something causes something you're absolutely sure that is true um, and you're validating that to, to you know, the end and you're really checking that um, use humans for our adaptability so we can take on new information straight away we can look into it um, and you know an AI has got to be fed that data we already can once we get it we have it um, and we can look into it and use our ethical understanding abilities and our general intelligence which AI has not managed to get yet um, validate your results continuously so in future not just now um, predict that unpredictable things will happen so make sure you're not um, allowing your AI to do things you know based only on the past you've got to You've got to understand that unpredictable things are going to happen and, uh, and account for that. And really, really importantly, is have algorithms that provide feedback so you can get some understanding. So many things have been caught out because they wrote something to get some feedback and how it actually made its decision. Um, like there was a medical scanning one where an AI was saying that all oh, these these patients, based on their scans, have a worse form of I can't remember what it was now, cancer or something. And then they got some feedback and the AI was not looking at the actual scan at all. It was looking at the label on the top of the scan, which was saying which hospital the scan came from. And one of them came from a specialist hospital where sicker patients tended to go. And that's how it was making its decision and nothing to do with the scan at all. So have feedback. It is so important. 
particularly with AIs that are so um, difficult to understand, we need some form of feedback um, and validation. And of course, be aware of the bias. That's the biggest thing. And, um, you know, make sure the end user is aware of the bias and everyone is, uh, you know, and if you're the end user, be aware of that bias and um, sort of adjust your levels of trust for the AI based on that. Um, yeah, so that's everything for me today. Um, if you have any sort of questions for me, we can go now and also I can leave my email or something like that if anyone has any um, questions. But yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I guess I'll open the floor to questions if there's time.